an introduction in there because I was about to criticize you. You were? I was going to say that this was going to be a, one of our best interviews yet and Ashley ruined it. I did? Why? Because you didn't charge our microphones. Oh. Well, technically our microphones ruined it because they ran out of battery. How on earth did that happen? I don't know. And then nobody reminded me to charge it. I just keep forgetting to remember because it's in a box and then I put it on my top shelf so I just never see it. Well, anyway, we had an interview with one of our favorite people, Pam Renal, and it was a really great interview, but I just have to warn everyone that our audio is not as amazing as I wish that it was. There was a lot of echo. I tried to edit it out the best that I could, but I hope that you will power through it and listen to what Pam has to say because you will not regret it. Can I just say in defense of myself that I also store the microphones and let us record in my apartment and set them up and clean them up and... You do not. We set them up and clean them up together. Sometimes, and sometimes you're running late, so then you leave and I have to do it. That happened once, and the, the reason you had to do it was because I had to get to a meeting that you scheduled right after. Okay, but still, I keep them at my apartment. Okay, it's... well, what was you? I would keep them at my apartment, except that there's nowhere to record in my apartment building. But I well, know. and and I have to walk down back and forth to your apartment every time we record. So it's actually a lot less convenient for me. I often wish that we could record in my building so that I didn't have to go all the way down there when it's pouring rain in the torrential downpour we of Los Angeles. You didn't have to come down in the rain. Well, I'm very sorry I forgot to record charge the recorder, but Sometimes people just forget things and we have to forgive them. I forgave you. I'm just letting our listeners know why this episode sounds bad. Okay, well, it's all my fault, everyone. Everything's your fault. Yeah, apparently. We're just kidding. We're not actually fighting. We're just debating. That's yeah. what twins do. Also, our intro isn't going to sound good either because we're at home and we don't have our microphones because they're at my apartment. Okay, should we do the good news minute? Oh, you know what I realized? What? On the last intro, we called it the Good News Minute the whole time. No, no. It's time for the inspirational in it. Because we all need a little inspiration since we're all sad that Aspen's so mean to her sister. Okay, so the inspirational in it today is just a small story that happened to me. But I told Ashley I wanted to share it because I feel like it's something that everybody should do. So the other day, I think Tuesday, I was just really in a funk all day. And I didn't really know why. I think it was maybe from lack of sleep. But I was telling Ashley that night that I was just didn't know how I was going to get through the week. And I was having a really hard time just being overwhelmed. I woke up on Wednesday morning and I have all 8 a.m. classes. So I woke up at 6 and didn't go to bed until like 1. So I was tired and lethargic and I was like another day that I don't know how I'm going to get through it and feeling in my funk and then feeling bad that I was in a funk. You always feel like you have so much to be grateful for and why are you having a bad day? And um, I picked up my phone to turn my alarm off and I read the daily readings in the morning before I get up like the bible readings because it helps me not get distracted by looking at social media or my email or whatever and i always check my text in the morning because sometimes ashley's high and she texts me at night i'm not high i'm not getting i do not get high i'm just kidding but the other night you texted me that you should be a spy and then i still stand by that i i think everyone can agree that i would make a great spy because i'm so small that i could just like slip right through things and people wouldn't notice me and people always think that i'm a kid so i could just be like walking through the park and spying on the russians or whatever and people would just be like oh that's just a little kid we don't have to worry about her but I'm actually a spy. The other thing that I texted Aspen the other night, I was not high, but I was like in that dream awake stage where you like think you have really great ideas, but you're half asleep, so they're not really great. Um, I texted Aspen that Earth is really just a giant bowl of soup and we are all just pieces of cabbage in that soup. <laughs> I'm yeah, not sure. Where did you come up with that? 
I don't know, but then I said I was going to write a book entitled We Are All Just Pieces of Cabbage in Your Soup or something like that. So you can see why I thought she might have been drugged or something. Yeah, but, but don't worry. I'm a good girl. I don't do that. But anyway, so I checked my text and I had a text from my best friend who will just randomly text sometimes like, hey, have a good day or I love you or whatever. And she was just like, whatever you go through today, just remember that I love you and I'm proud of you and you got this. It was just like completely out of the blue. Like we hadn't been talking at all the day before or anything. And I guess it was like best friend intuition. intuition that almost made me cry because I just like really needed that and needed some motivation to do the hard things that I knew I was gonna have to do that day and like keep on keeping on I feel like I have a hard time not indulging in my temptation to be in a bad mood so that just really made my day and so I just wanted to share that even though that's not a big inspirational in it I think that if you have somebody who's on your mind, just say hi to them, give them some words of inspiration because you don't know how much they need it. And if you are someone who needs it, talk to someone that you love or that you know loves you. I mean, hopefully you just both love each other, but um, <laughs> I don't know. I've been thinking that we make it seem like it's really just not okay to not be okay because you should be grateful and you should be positive, but sometimes you will just have a bad day. And so don't be afraid to just Tell someone you need a little boost of positivity. If no one else, you can message us on Instagram or if you have our phone number or whatever, and I will give you a dose of positivity because if you listen to our podcast, I don't care who you are or if I've never met you. I still love you unless you're like a serial killer or something. I mean, I guess you're supposed to love everybody, but I might question your life choices, but I'll still give you some inspiration to do the right thing today. Okay, anyway. Okay. And everybody just remember that we're all just pieces of cabbage in the same <laughs> bowl of soup. I think what I was thinking is like the ocean is like all water. So it's like soup. And then like the, when you see like maps, the land is green. So it's like cabbage. I don't know. That's That just might be what I was thinking. I but... can see that. Okay, let me tell you about our guest today. Our guest is Pam Renal, who is an actress and a producer and an entrepreneur extraordinaire. She kind of just does everything. Um, she started working in media and advertising sales, but she decided to pursue acting a couple years ago. And not a couple years. Not ago. a couple years, but like. 10 or so I think she said 2016 yeah I think she did but to me 2016 is only a couple years ago because it doesn't feel like it was eight years ago she has really created a very successful career for herself and is producing her own projects and this summer she played our mom in our pilot one of us we have to clarify she played our stepmom because later she'll talk about it. Oh, mom. okay. She played our stepmom. She is just one of the most amazing, kindest people that we have worked with. So we just wanted everyone to get to hear from her and hear how she became such a positive person all the time. We just think she's amazing and we are super excited that we got to interview her and have her on the show. And pretty soon she's going to be like winning Oscars. So you heard it here first. We discovered her. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. Without further ado, here is Pam Renal. Yay. You always cut out my cheering at the end. Oh, okay. I want this time. Okay. Well, hi, ladies. How have you been? Good, good. Busy, but good. You know, selling yeah. some movies, working on some other ones. Yeah, it's definitely been busy, but exciting. And I'm working at the Oscars again this year. So I'm super excited. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah. Is that in March? Yep, March 10th. And I just found out I'm going to be also producing at the Women's Image Network Awards again. So I'm flying out on February 11th. Oh, oh nice. Wow. Does it stress you out to fly a lot or do you not mind it? Good question. I used to have a really hard time traveling. I went through this weird period. Um, I got stuck in... New Zealand on September 11th and I couldn't come home. Oh my gosh. 
and I was visiting my husband's family. And ever since then, I had a hard time traveling because I felt like I didn't want to be far from home again. And then mm. now I'm I'm good. I, I don't mind. You know, we have our two old dogs. So as long as one of us is here just to take care of them, I feel okay. Mm. So I don't mind going. Okay, before yeah. we start, I have to ask you because we were just having this debate since you live in Colorado, but you've come to LA a lot. Do you think that DIA or LAX is worse? DIA. Okay, that's what we think too. Yeah. But everyone in LA is like, LAX is the worst nope. airport ever. And I'm like, when we go there, it takes us like 30 minutes max to get through. And DIA is usually it takes a us like 10 minutes. Yeah. It used to be, LAX used to be crazy because mm-hmm. they used to have it set up where everybody, including like like the Ubers, would get in line to come through in the taxis. And so oh. you could never, you'd always, I'd always miss my flight because I'm like, I can't even get into the airport. And then they separated it. So you have to go. And ever since they did that, it's so easy, LAX. And DIA is absolutely ridiculous. Yep. Well, I didn't know that it used to not be separated. So yeah. I'm sure that was a nightmare. But <laughs> that was smart of them to do yeah. that. Well, anyway, thank you so much for doing this. We yeah. have wanted to have you on for a while, but we were like, we should wait till after the strike so she can talk about stuff. So first of all, I know you were an actor as a kid. And I was just wondering if your parents were performers or if you kind of just came upon it on your own, what first sparked your interest in acting? No, my dad was actually a politician. Um, so I grew up in the in a, a very interesting political environment on the East Coast. And I literally have wanted to act since I was a little girl. My first babysitter was an actress. Um, her name was Valerie. And so we'd always like do these performances and put on plays. So when I was six, I was um, a flower, a dancing flower in Puff the Magic Dragon. And <laughs> we have really cute pictures of that. I was like, mom, I'm in this leotard with like these petals around my face. Aww. And then I did, you know, I started auditioning for shows and not, it's school, right? I worked, I loved musical theater, even though I really can't sing to save my life. But um, I did like Bye Bye Birdie and I was Lisa on Sound of Music and I was Yenta the Matchmaker and, and Fiddler on the Roof. So I just kept pursuing that all the way through school. <laughs> Well, you must have not been that bad of a singer because we did musical theater all through middle and high school and never, we were always in the ensemble. Yeah. So. It's so interesting because on social media now connecting with my teachers, we didn't have social media back then. And so, mm-hmm. you know, now I still call them like Mr. and Mrs. Klein and like Miss Wilson, my teacher. But I asked her, I was like, I can't sing. And she said, I was the most confident 10 year old that she's like, you just went out there and did it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So I was like, okay, I can't imagine how good that sounded. But yeah, so I think it's because when you're little, no one tells you you can't do something. You know, as you grow up, people are like, well, you shouldn't do this or you can't do this or you start to doubt yourself. And that's when I think that it affects you just as a person. You, it yeah. affects your confidence and you really shouldn't have to have that. Yeah, when I was seven, I thought I was like the most amazing opera singer in the world. And then... <laughs> I grew up and I found out that I actually didn't know how to carry a tune and I would like I didn't know any of the words to the songs that I was singing so I would just like make up these words and say they were Latin but they were really just (laughs) gibberish gibberish, yeah it's your own it's the summer's language um yeah mm -hmm. yes (laughs) yeah people always say that twins have their own language that's right I guess we could probably understand each other. Do you remember when we tried to make up our own language? No, I don't. We tried to make up our own language when we were like five or six. It oh, was, yeah. It was called, it was called Dr. Spanish. Oh, my God. That's hilarious. It was like the guy on the Wii, like Dr. Egghead or whatever, was one of the characters from Mario Kart. And he was like the creator of the language. Oh, I don't remember that. Oh, you but... don't? See, you guys have been creative since you were little in every capacity. So Apparently, <laughs> yeah. We tried to like sell jewelry made of paper clips on our driveway when we were three. We opened a drive through restaurant in our window and we were really upset that nobody stopped at our restaurant. <laughs> yeah, we would like tape menus up all over the windows and just sit there and wait for people to come by and they never did. That should be its own little short film. That's a good idea. We yeah. should. Okay, we'll, we'll make it when we come back to Denver. You can 
<laughs> Perfect. <long>. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Okay. You got it. Okay. Well then tell us how you, well, I guess tell us what you did after you were done with school and then how you got back into acting. So um, in college, I majored in speech pathology and audiology. Um, and I worked closely with the deaf community and, and I was fascinated with diseases of the inner ear and learning about those things. And then I was about to go to graduate school and I ended up taking a different turn and working in corporate America, um, working as a financial advisor and stockbroker at Charles Schwab. And then I um, worked at Dish Network. Um, I wrote and produced a children's television show for two years called Dish for Kids. And it was really fun promoting all the different shows that were on Dish Network because they had so many different channels. And then Schwab recruited me back and I really missed that creative side, right? You don't realize, you know, it's kind of like, I don't know. I didn't know what I didn't know. And I didn't know how much I loved it until I was out of it. And then um, I went with my husband. I think we were watching Harry Potter at the theater and there was a big ad before the movie started. And it said to advertise on our big screen, call this number. And I said, well, that'd be an interesting company to work for. And I looked into it and it turned out they were hiring here in Colorado. And I started there as a manager, worked my way up to a vice president. And I managed the advertising operations for AMC, Regal, Cinemark, and 32 other theater chains across the country doing all of their pre-show advertising. So my clients were, you know, a lot of local ads across the country, as well as all the movie studios um, and TV networks promoting their upcoming, you know, shows that people going to the theater would be like, oh, that's interesting. I'd love to watch it. Um, and after being there for, I think, almost 14 years, I left the company and I worked so much. I was like, wow, I don't even have a hobby. I'm not sure what I want to do. And a lot of people told me I was overqualified for work. So that was interesting. And I took this class and in this class, it was like kind of like a soul searching kind of class. Like, what do you want to do with your life? And the lady that taught it said, what about your life today would make your eight-year-old self cry? And I said that I'm not an actress. And everyone kind of laughed. And I just, because I spit it out so quickly, I was like, oh my God, like that's all I did growing up. And so I thought, well, that's interesting. And so my husband was like, what do you think we're going to see on the big screen at the age of 50? And so, you know, like eight years later, here we are, <laughs> here we go. And so I took classes. I got a scholarship at Denver Center Performing Arts. I jumped back in, took a lot of acting classes and um, just networked with fantastic people. And I just got really lucky and had a lot of great opportunities and I got headshots taken and I was you know, learning as I went, kind of paving the road as I drove on it. And I just kind of said yes to opportunities and, and things that sounded interesting to me with good people. That's kind of how I, my whole world works. If I like the people and I like what they're doing and the story they're telling, I'm in, you know, I'd love to support it in any capacity. And that's kind of the road I took. <laughs> So before you took that class, do you think you were ever considering going back to acting or like, was that even something in your mind or did you just kind of like move on from it and not really even think about it? So that's a really good question. Um, so when I was 17, my dad passed away and I just like never touched anything like that again. Like my whole world of like, oh, my fun acting and creative and fun things. And I just focused more on like serious and work. Although every summer I would say to my mom, wow, it'd be really fun if I got a job working at like a theater. There's all this community theater here. And she was like, no, no, that's not a career. What are you thinking? So we'd have this conversation about once a year. And so I never did it. And then I really didn't think about it for a long time. But when I was at um, National Cinemedia, I was around a lot of celebrities, right? I was on a lot of red carpets just with my clients and my president was like, let's have Pam interview some of these celebrities because she's with them all the time. So I did this little show called Pam Demonium where I was on a red carpet interviewing some celebrities. And then I just never really thought about pursuing the acting part because I liked really being behind the camera a lot. It's, it's, as you guys know, it's very vulnerable being in front of a camera, right? And so having to learn that again and going from the theater environment to being on camera, it's a huge change because I was used to being so big and having to really dial it back and pull on those emotions. It was like a whole new learning thing for me. So I guess I hadn't really thought about it again in a long time until that that class. And then I was like, I love this. And so, and the second I jumped back in, I just been like, no looking back. Was it immediate that you went back into acting or how did you, how did the progression kind of happen from that realization to when you actually took that leap? It was that, I think it was around June um, of, I think it was 2015, I think it was 16, 2016. And I was just trying to look. So I looked online and I saw that there was some like extras work posted in the film industry networking thing on Facebook. And so I went and I was an extra in an 80s movie called Terror Tales. And then while I was there, 
the woman that was supposed to have one of the lead roles as the mom at the last second from LA, um, it was a non-union film. And I think she went back to SAG and so she wasn't eligible. So the director was like, would you be interested in auditioning for the mom? And I was like, sure. So I ended up getting that. But while I was filming that, I met these fantastic young ladies that were just graduating school and they were actors and producers. And so they were amazing. So they were giving me all this information and helping me. And so they said, we're also working on this local project. Maybe you can come and be an extra. I was like, sure. Because as I said, I think working in any capacity in our industry, we're learning, right? Whether we're connecting, learning, watching, doing. And so I was like, sure. So I went to be an extra on set. And while I was on set, that director said, hey, I, I, I'd love for you to be the mom in this series. Would you be interested? And I was like, sure. So I sent him an audition. And then it just started going like that. And I got headshots, put them out there. And then MTV called and said, hey, we've got this show. <laughs> We'd love for you to come and play this mom. Again, the mom. You see a theme emerging here. So um, I went and I filmed that. And then it just kind of, you know, when I was filming Terror Tales, one of the actors on set, his name is Christopher Showerman, and he's so talented. And he was George of the Jungle too. He's such a good actor that when I was on set, I was like, I have to take classes. Because this is like, these people are fantastic. Um, so that's when I went through Denver Center for Forming Arts. I got a full scholarship and I was able to take some classes and really dive back in. It was that fall and then it just kept going. Wow. So it was pretty like within those next few months, but I'm a firm believer that if something keeps representing itself to you, or you keep thinking about it, there's something in it for you. So pay attention and just be open to it. Yeah, I mean, that's really crazy that it just seems like it kind of just snowballed. And I think that's a testament to that you must have like already had a lot of talent just like waiting to come out when you started <laughs> acting and I think also you in our experience are the most fun person to work with because you are so kind to everybody and you just like make it a really fun environment and I think that it's hard to find actors like that so I think that must have been why everyone was so ready to work with you and offer you jobs because they were just like wanted to steal you up before someone else did. <laughs> Yeah. You're so nice. Thank you for saying that. Um, I don't know about that, but I, thank you for the compliment. Um, I worked on this movie called Unmarked as a teacher that Alec Ibarra was, I think he was 14 at the time, and he wrote, directed, starred in, edited, produced his whole project, this feature film that ended up like, in, I think it was an AMC in a bunch of theaters across the country. And um, I learned a lot being on that set and working with some, you guys were in that, weren't one of you guys were in I that with in me. That, yeah. See? You were in that with me, but it's those connections, right? Like you yeah. meet people, you're like, I met them and I loved working with them. And I feel like those connections and those relationships further you down the road because you never know who you're going to work with. And when you meet people to your point that you click with and you like, that's the group, right? Because it's like it's good energy. It's good passion. It's, and you two are just fantastic to work with. You're, I think you're both just geniuses and brilliant and so talented in so many capacities. And I was so honored to work with you both. And I can't wait to see where your careers take you. Well, thank you. Um, but yeah, I think that is so important for people to know is that no matter who you meet, you just have to be kind to them and try to stay connected and make connections with people who you believe in and who you click with. Because I think a lot of people that I've met are kind of resistant to work with newer filmmakers or they are a little bit, I guess, self-important and they don't want to take opportunities unless it's like the perfect job or the perfect pay or whatever. But I think that so many people that I met when I was just starting out or when they were just starting out now have these great careers and I've like stayed in contact with them and they reached back out and like offered me jobs and stuff. And I think that you just never know who's going to end up where. So I think I mean, also, it's good to just have connections and have friendships with people because that makes life better. But also when you're trying to build a career in any industry, I think that I mean, I hate it because I don't like networking, but also like networking is really important. And I think that people need to remember that. Yeah, I think people like to your point, because, you know, one, everybody should be a nice person, right? It takes two minutes yeah. to do something nice for another person. It all comes back around. And I think together as we're supporting each other and we should help each other. And, you know, if we like people and we like their product, like, of course, let's work together. Let's make, let's make it happen. Cause we can right? anything that we have control over. Let's do it. Why not? Yeah. And there's so much competition in our industry. And I think that it is useless because I think there's this myth that there's only enough success for a couple of people, but when people work together and lift each other up, then it, makes it better for everybody in the end yeah a thousand percent and I think as an actor too right it's not a competition like it's like when you read a book and you're reading a script or a book that you're picturing the character in your head 
and you're either it or you're not like, and that's okay. It's just like, you're either what they're looking for or they're not. And there's so many other factors out of your control. So as an actor, you just have to enjoy the process, right? Of like creating your audition, loving the material, finding your character, meeting the people, do your audition and move on to the next one. And if it's meant to be yours, it'll be yours, right? In the meantime, you had a great time and worked with great people. Do you think that because you came into acting kind of like as a second or third career that that kind of affected your perspective? because I feel like a lot of people when they come into it fresh out of school or whatever they're like it is such a competition and it's like I have to make it I have to be the next big thing or no matter what get to the top and I feel like you have such a positive creative passionate mindset and you're like I just want to do whatever I can do so do you think that approaching it from more of just a curiosity like I'm going to try this and see what happens. Do you think that affected your perspective or do you think you've just kind of always been that way and it wouldn't have mattered when you entered the industry? No, that's a great question. And I think because I am coming at this late in the game, right? And I've had other careers and I think I approach things from a business perspective a lot Mm -hmm. um, because that's just how, what I've been doing for so many years. That's just kind of how my brain works. And I think had I done this just coming, if I would have continued on, right? Like, right through high school and kept going, I feel like I may have gotten burnt out because it is a tough industry, right? And you do feel like it is a competition because as an actor, your validation is booking the job, right? So if you don't book it, you're just like, oh, I didn't get it. And and it's hard to continue to stay positive because that's the validation you get. Um, Because we don't hear back, right? You just move on to the next one. It's like, I didn't, you either get it or you don't. And so I think we all, you know, strive to have that mentality of like, I'm doing it for the love of the art and telling a story. And our job is to audition and hopefully book it and move on if you don't. But it is, it is hard. And I have a lot of our group of actor friends. We all try to support each other. I'm like, luckily we're not going through this at the same time. (laughs) We're all like, keep going, keep going. You got this. Because we all have those moments, including me, where I'm like, oh, what am I doing? (laughs) Okay. trying to do this in my, at my age, but, um, I, I've taken enough classes and I've learned from so many of these great casting directors when the pandemic hit and we couldn't do anything again, my thought process is, okay, well, what can I do? Right. Mm-hmm. So the casting directors were out of work too. So I took a lot of their classes and, um, this casting director that I love named Seth Kasky, he's in LA. He cast that show that was, um, on, I think it was on, was it on Amazon? It was called glow. Um, the wrestling shows in the 80s. It's fantastic. And he taught this class and this had the biggest impact on me and it helped change my mindset because I was asking him, I'm like, do you think I should change my hair color? He's like, does Pam want to change her hair color? He's like, why? He's like, be you. Like, they're all like, we want you. Like their goal is to find the right actor. Like we want you to be you and we're rooting for you. And so in this class, he had groups of three and we all had the same script. And so my script was the flight attendant script. So we all you know, did a self tape. And then the next class we came back and we all watched them. And he was like, okay, so for these three women, girl, a, what airline would she work for? And they're like, Oh, Southwest. And they were like, this girl B they're like, probably frontier. And like, and Pam, they're like, probably some airbrit, like elite first class lounge. <laughs> but he's like, and they were all fantastic auditions. He's like, but it depends on the part, the vibe, what are we looking for? And it, it just made it so clear to me that I'm like, he's right. Like, there's no right or wrong. It's just, you're either what they're looking for or you're not. And just be you and be the best version you can be. I think that's really an important perspective. I mean, not just in acting, but like in life, I feel like a lot of us are so conditioned to just be like, what am I supposed to be in this scenario? And like, what do my professors want me to be? What do these girls want me to be so that I can be friends with them? Not just who do I want to be be and then not everyone's gonna like you even though as people pleasers you really wish that they would so I think it's really hard to just come to terms with that and like allow yourself to be who you want to be I always say be yourself because everybody else is already taken right very true yeah not you're not like I always say I'm not everybody's cup of tea and that's okay you know, and it is what it is. And I'm going to try to be me in every situation. And this is what it is, you know, try to be a good person and be kind and be friendly and meet people and you click, you don't click. It's okay. As long as you're, I feel like end of day, if you're a good person, you make good decisions, it'll come back that way. Um, do you ever, cause you're so positive and like nice all the time. <laughs> How do you stay that way? And do you ever just feel tempted to scream at somebody? Cause they're like, <laughs> being a jerk on set or something and how do you or like 
get really down when you're ha- going through like a dry spell or like during COVID or something when there's such a lack of creative outlet and how do you deal with those <laughs> moments? Yep, I have those. We all do. <laughs> um, my group, like I keep like, I have a great group of friends and supporters and people in this industry and people that I connect with and we all help each other because we all have those like days where you're just like, oh my God, like I said, where I'm like, what am I doing? Like my friend Becca Jung in LA, we're like always like, oh my God, what am I doing? I don't think I can continue acting. She's like, stop it. You're good. Keep going. Keep going. I'm like, I'm having one of those days where I'm feeling, but I'm very vocal about it. So I try to like, because sometimes you, it's, it's easy to be like, I'm feeling depressed. I'm just going to like watch a sad movie and eat some popcorn, you know? Um, and that's okay too, right? People have, and I feel like I've just learned to just know that it's a moment and it's a feeling and it'll pass and change. And I know that, and I'll be like, I'm just having this and I need to just experience what I'm feeling right now. But I do, you know, get frustrated and I try to, it's hard. We're all human, right? To control your emotions. And when you're frustrated, I just try to verbally express like, I'm feeling this way just so somebody understands. And I'm like, this is frustrating to me. Or a really good friend of mine, Krista Bradley, she's brilliant filmmaker, actor, writer, producer, and director. And so we, we always tell her, I'm like, we're like sisters. Cause we are both like, no, I don't like how you're talking right now. And this is frustrating me, but we have that great communication. And to me, to be able to talk that way and be open is a huge trust factor, right? To trust each other and to be able to be honest with how you're feeling. Um, so I, I just try to surround myself with friends that we all just support, trust, love each other, and just understand that we all, you know, someone's having a bad day. We get it. You're having a grump. Like I just told my husband, I'm like, I feel like everyone's in like kind of a grumpy mood today, but I get that. And that's okay. I'm not going to judge. I try not to judge because I'm like, it's okay. They didn't mean it. They're having a grumpy day, but we all do try to be as much as I can (laughs) positive. I laugh when things get really bad because I don't know how else to handle the situation, (laughs) but you just got, it's hard. But like I said, as I'm getting older and the more things that I'm working on, I try to focus on, okay, well, what can I control? Right. And I think that's from, you know, being a vice president and running a business too. Like, okay, we can't do this. What can I do during a pandemic or whatever's happening? If I can't do this, great. Well, then I'm going to make a short because I can do that. I may not have gotten that part in the movie that I really wanted or that network show, but that's okay. I can make a fun short that maybe people will love. So I can make a positive impact. I can control it. I'm doing it. So I feel good because I hit that goal and that makes me feel better. And I feel like you have such a mindset of you're just always like, well, we could do this. We could create this. Like I, I'm going to go do this or I'm going to connect these people. And you're just always like thinking about what you can do and like what's next. And I think that's I'm sure that's helpful to like keep you going when times are tough because like you said, you can't control everything. And I don't know about you, but I'm a major control freak. And so it's really hard for me when there's stuff that I can't control. And I think that's the best way to stay positive is to find ways to be creative and to help other people rather than just like spiraling into pity. darkness. Yeah, darkness. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's stuff. true. And I think, especially in our industry, there's so much out of our control. And even though we know that it's still hard and you go through those phases where you're like, oh my gosh, what am I doing? And then you have to like make yourself think, okay, what can I do? Even if it's like, I'm just going to go volunteer or I'm going to go, you know, donate a bunch of stuff to some, like to make, it makes me feel good to do something like that. Or like, to your point, I'm going to make something. I'm going to connect people. These guys are working hard. What can I do to help you promote your project? Or like the Women's Image Network Awards, right? Like my friend Phyllis, I was just talking to her. I'm like, can I help promote your project? And she was saying like the awards, they honor men and women who create outstanding film and television that promote and value women. And I'm like, I love that. What a great organization. How can I help you? What can I do? I'm flying out there for her event on the 11th. She's been doing this like 25 years because she wants to, and she likes to support women. And I'm like, that's great energy. And I'm all about it. Um, Well, kind of going off of that, you have done so many amazing projects and I'm sure that, I mean, I don't, I know it's like a hard industry, but I also imagine you probably get a lot that comes to you or a lot of opportunities because I feel like before you, before we worked with you, I had heard of you so many times because I feel like everyone just like loves working with Pam. And so I was wondering, I guess, first of all, how you decide what projects you want to work on, but then also in your own words, why film is so valuable and important and like what kind of messages you want the projects that you're a part of to like promote I guess yeah um no that's a great question I think for me and thank you for saying that I'm sure there's a lot of like non-PAM fans out there that are like and I know I spread myself thin and I always I'm a people pleaser also when I try to say yes and help everybody and then you can't and then I'm like oh my god I didn't do this and this person's upset with me and I feel so bad 
Um, but you know, it is what it is. You got to do. I can only be do so much. Um, but as far as films go, again, it's about like, I'm an energy person and a people person. And so if I like, like when I read your guys, this, remember, cause you guys messaged me and I was like, I was in LA and then your project, I was like, I don't think I can make the deadline, but I was like, send me, and then I read the script. I was like, oh, this is fantastic. So it's all about if I find, if the story's interesting and I like the people, right. Cause it's like a family we work together. Like you said, we want it to be fun too, right. We're doing something fun. Let's celebrate each other and work with fun people. But again, to me, the stories, it's about, I love telling stories that make you leave and be like, huh, I never thought about that. <laughs> or it makes you think of something that you like in a totally different perspective, because we're all like conditioned to think my whole life. I've thought this. And then I'll watch something and be like, huh, I never knew that. Or I never thought about that. And I love st telling those stories that aren't told or in a different capacity that make you think about it differently than you would have. And maybe you don't have to agree with it or not, but just open your mind and just be like, huh, that's interesting. Or what if I love those that keep you thinking and your script did that for me. And I was like, I love this. I, I mean, this is fantastic. Well, since we're talking about one of us, I was wondering who you think killed Ethan, because <laughs> for our listeners who might not know, it's a story about twins whose stepbrother gets murdered and they find one of their DNA on the crime scene, but they don't know if there's a different reason why one of the twins' DNA was there or if one of them did it. And nobody knows who actually did it that was in the cast or crew except for me and Ashley and the director. So, um... <laughs> Pam, who do you think did it? I think your boyfriend did it. I mean, oh. no, 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 I don't. No, wait, that was one of my, okay, wait, that was one of them, but then it switched because I think it's your mom. Your mother did it because I would think, so I started thinking, I was like, because she would have the same DNA maybe because oh. of somebody's DNA. Yeah. So I started, because first I was like, oh, maybe it's the boyfriend because, you know, because sometimes it's a character that is not in the main thing. So I was like, oh, but their mom would have their DNA. So I was thinking, yeah. and she kind of went missing and where was she? And maybe she's jealous or I don't know. So that was kind of where I thought. <laughs> I don't think I can't theory. wait to find out. <laughs> yeah, I like that. But I think we decided on set one day that we were going to change it to be the dog that killed him. Yeah. <laughs> That dog, and that was my favorite part. Do you remember how hard we laughed? Because we're trying to get this, like, what, six-pound dog to, like, bark and go crazy. Yeah. And so we're trying all these things and trying all these things. And then the door opens, and the dog goes, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because that little brat would bark nonstop every scene we were trying to do and, like, ruin all of the takes because he was barking at people until the one scene we needed him to bark, and then he was just, like, sleeping. Yeah. He was sleeping in my arm in his little sweater. The sweater is the cutest dog ever. Pumpkin. Okay, oh. that would be hilarious. The dog did it. That could yeah. be interesting, though. Like, the dog gets into something poisonous and then licks his face or something. Yeah. Ooh. I feel like if any dog was going to do that, like, accidentally <laughs> kill somebody from poisoning them, it would be Pumpkin. Pumpkin so vicious um so do you have a favorite either like favorite project you've worked on or I know you've met a lot of celebrities like through your job before this and then in some of the films you've done do you have like a coolest person that you've ever got to work with um I mean every project I've been on has been so much fun and I've loved it everybody they've just been so much fun on set right like Yours has been like one of my favorites just because I love you guys so much. And it was, and I, and you guys know, I keep telling this, but I'm just so impressed by you and what you do. And I don't know if you realize your level of talent. I really don't know if you understand how talented you are. Like seriously. And you're so organized and communicative. I'm like, this is fantastic. Like every set can be this way. Um, I would say one of my favorite people that I've worked with in the last few years is there's an actor named Mark Christopher Lawrence. And he's a comedian and he's really, really funny. And it was during the pandemic and we were filming up in Estes Park um, for our movie. And I think they just changed the name of it to, I can't remember the name. Oh, it's called Everyone Thinks We're Dating. Okay. And it's a super cute rom-com um, about this couple, like their best friends, their whole little friends group. And one of them's getting married, but then the two friends, her dad, who's Mark Christopher Lawrence, he's a preacher and he's always trying to get her married and set her up. And she was like, I can't with this. So she and her best guy friend pretended they were engaged. Mm -hmm. And so it's a really cute movie. And it's so funny, but on set, we were up in Estes Park <laughs> and it was like, Six degrees. It's probably less than that. It was freezing. And Mark's from California. He's like, I've never been in snow. And he's so funny. And so we would just kind of like not prank each other, but we'd 
we make each other laugh throughout the whole time because some of the showers weren't working in some of these places we were staying and he would send us videos of himself washing dishes because his water was working great um and he's really clumsy like i am and so he got like he he fell head face first in the snow mushy snow so he instead of like just sitting backwards he tried to like lean forward and then he went face deep and he's a big guy so it took like six people to try to pull him up backwards and get him out of the snow i'm just sitting there laughing and then then he gets a hand cramp because it's so cold. So then he said, well, just bring me some mustard. And they're like, we have mustard on set for Mark Christopher Lawrence, MCL. I'm like, mustard? I have this on video. He puts mustard in his mouth and the mustard gets rid of cramps or something. Huh. So we had the most hilarious. And then I accidentally kicked over a bunch of candles. And the two of us were like really clumsy and just like little soul buddies. And so I still like hear from him almost every single day. And it's been like two years. Yeah, he's really funny. We just had a good time and he's such a good actor. So I love, cause I learn, like I said, I learn from so many different people right on set and I watch and observe and he's such a strong actor and just so authentic and grounded and just lovely. And just what a great guy and so professional. And he was really fun to work with. He's one of my favorites. That's Aww. awesome. That sounds like yeah. fun. Yeah. Was it a Christmas movie? Yes, fun. it was a Christmas movie. Um, and then it was called lying together originally, but then when you're selling a film for distributors, sometimes they're like that title may not sell good if we're focusing on some faith-based genres, cause it, it may have a different like double entendre. So they changed it to everyone thinks we're dating. When I was at AFM this year, selling one of our movies, I saw I'm like, Oh, I'm, I'm in your movie because the poster was on the wall. <laughs> So the distributor was like, what? I'm like, yeah, I'm Debbie Hansen in that. So they were like, no way. So I talked to them and they were so nice and the sales agent. So yeah. <laughs> well, I guess speaking of you selling movies, let's get into a little bit how you moved into producing and um, making your own movies. Because I feel like you are also pretty prolific in that area as well. So um, how did you start doing that from acting? Okay, that's a good question. So one of my best friends and colleagues for over 20 years, John C. Hall, he was the EVP of marketing and distribution at Universal Pictures. He was there for over 22 years. And John and his boss, Adam Fogelson, who was another friend of mine and colleague, Adam was the chairman at Universal Pictures. And while actually we were at a dinner in Vegas for CinemaCon um, when I was in, as a vice president, Adam Fogelson was like, oh, so you're an actress. I was like, no, I'm a vice president. He's like, you're not an actress. I'm like, well, no, I grew up acting, but no. And he's like, you're missing your whole thing. And so all these years later, he laughed. He's like a huge supporter of mine and a wonderful friend. And so I'm always like, he's now the chairman at Lionsgate and Adam's just like an amazing human. And um, we've all stayed you know, pretty close over the years. And John left Universal Pictures and was producing a movie called I Feel Fine. And he was in West Virginia and he said, hey, can you send me your demo reel? And so I was like, absolutely. And he's like, the directors want you for a part. And so I flew out there and then um, I ended up getting COVID and I had to go, come in late, Aww. but they ended up making me this, have a small part as a teacher in this movie. And then while we were on set, we all just clicked and they're like, we really like Pam. And then I jumped in to help some of the production stuff had fallen off. And so I was like, I'm happy to help. What do you need? And so I jumped in on the production side of it and I just worked on so many different pieces um, for them. And then, then John and I were working on a couple other projects together with our own production companies that we were doing. And we wanted to, we, again, we want to tell these unique stories and my partners like to work on the projects that they've written, you know, and then same with John's. And so John's dad was like, you should work with Pam. You guys work so well together for all these years. You have so much fun. And so we decided to start our own company called Retinue Media. And then everything just, we partnered with Alexander Rain from Bellator Productions and Peter J. Ward. And we got all these projects going and then we're working on the next one now called Vacancy. And then Xander has a project, Alexander Rain called Sucker and Megan is a good girl and he's all these amazing projects and a, a movie that Peter J. Ward is doing called Mr. Wright's Red Ink is amazing. And, you know, we're talking to Julie Andrews and um, there's just oh, someone wow. who's yeah, in his, in his writing partner is Nick Pileggi who wrote Goodfellas, right? So they're wow. a very talented group. And they have a pilot that they've written as well. And so just connecting together, we've got all these. We're just trying to partner together and help each other. And we all have just worked so well together. So it's been amazing. And that's kind of what's happening. And so then I'm like, okay, let's produce these. And I'm learning a ton, right, on this other side of the business um, and getting them like funded and sold and distributed. And it's been fantastic. And so that's kind of when I'm jumping in and I can have a small part in these movies. And I'm like, oh, that sounds fun. Sure, I'll do that. And that is all from being on set, being a nice person, right, and talking to people and now we're all producing these projects together with those directors austin and Haley spicer they're so talented 
They wrote this other fantastic thriller that we're going into pre-production on right now. They're just amazing. That's really yeah. amazing. It seems like you just are so ready to like jump into everything and that. That's really cool that you're like doing all of this stuff. Yeah, I'm trying to do it like good people. Like I said, like if it feels good and I click with the people and we all have that same kind of like work ethic, we're like work really hard. We're great communicators. We're all on the same page. You ask any one of us a question, we all have the same answer. Like we're all on the same page and it moves forward so easily. Those are the ones. I know that we've talked to you for a long time, so we'll wrap up. Um, but we have two questions that we always like to ask okay. our guests at the end. First of all, do you have a favorite inspirational quote? Um, I guess my favorite quote is the one that I said I always I always say. It's just, I, mean, I don't know if I made it up or somebody else's quote, but I always say this, but be yourself. Everyone else is already taken. Because I always say like, embrace your you, like you're you. So be you. People are either going to love it or they don't, but that's okay. Like be you and you know, you'll find your group. I always say I'm on like a, an AM wavelength. Most people are on FM. So when I find like my AM people, I'm like, yeah, this is my channel. So be you, it is, you know, everyone else is already taken. Yeah, I love that. Um, and then our last question is, if you could have an identical twin, do you think that you would want one? I don't think the world could handle two Pams. Neither could <laughs> the shopping malls. <laughs> no. I would say I don't think they could handle two of me, but watching you guys, you're like a dynamic duo. It's inspiration for everybody to have that. So it makes me think that would be kind of fun. I don't think I could handle two of myself because I would drive myself crazy. <laughs> That's our problem a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Well, to have someone that knows you that well, right? Because I have a sister too. We're three years apart, but we know each other so well that she's just like, you're just being this way. I'm like, I am, you know, but it's good to have that. I think that's awesome. My my grandmother was an identical twin. So my grandma and my aunt Lee, and they were so funny, and cute and lovely. It's so, you know, it's in our genes. So I love it. Oh, I think your mom told me about that after <laughs> one of us premiered. She, she did. Like, they used to always play tricks on people. Yeah, because they're identical twins. Like, I mean, it's hard to tell them apart. Yeah, when you get to know them, you know, but yeah. Somebody just told us the other day that they didn't believe us that we were identical twins, which is so funny. Because really? like, some people think we look exactly like and they can't tell us apart. And then some people are like, no, you're not identical. There's no way. Really? It's really? so weird. Yeah. It is weird. But like, no. we're 100% sure we're identical. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm sorry yeah. you know better, but we are, I promise. I'm pretty sure, but thanks for... Thanks for flagging that for us. <laughs> yeah. Well, one time someone was like, are you two twins? And we were like, yeah. And he was like, but you're not the same age, are you? And we were like, that's what twins are. So yes. I've always thought it would be cool if we were like those twins who, I feel like every year there's a story of twins who were born, one not in like 1159 on New Year's Eve and one not like 1202 on New Year's Day. So you were born in different years. Years. Yeah, that's true. Um, well, thank you so much yeah, for doing thank this. You. It was so good to get to talk to you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, guys. It was so good to see you. And let me know next time you're back here. And yes, I know. I know you're super busy, but if you're in L.A. and you're bored, let us okay. know. And we'll definitely. I know none of us like coffee, but we'll. we'll no, I'll make time. Else. I'll make time. We'll go see you. We'll have like Diet Cokes and water somewhere. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you so yeah, much. Thank you, guys. Yeah.